featured in this issue, an in-depth interview with Lisa Morton, author and president of the Horror Writers Association, and a conversation about The Shining with Sterling and Stone author David Wright. Hey everyone, I am bringing in a special guest in this segment. I uh, thought I would introduce you to him before we get started. Uh, this is David Wright, and uh, some of you probably know David. He's a, he's a very prolific writer. Uh, he wrote an incredibly dark book uh, called Crash, which you should definitely check out. Uh, but David is also a third of uh, Sterling and Stone, and you may know him as also uh, uh, one third of the self-publishing podcast. Uh, David's a great guy. I met him a few years ago. We have a lot in common, and I asked him to come on to the show and talk about some of his favorite horror films. Uh, so we kind of bounced some ideas back and forth. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to rewatch films, and uh, so I could talk about it uh, with David. Uh, so this is the, the first segment. Um, he'll be back to talk about some more, but uh, I thought before we do that, I would introduce you to him. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is David Wright. Welcome, everyone. I am here with Mr. David Wright. We are talking about some of our favorite horror films of all time. And uh, this one is definitely a classic for many reasons, many, many reasons. Uh, the film I'm talking about, one of my personal favorites of all time, of all genres, The Shining. Uh, so, spoiler alert, if you've never seen it, shame on you. <laughs> if you've uh, never seen it, what's wrong with you? We're yeah, talking right. about the Jack Nicholson version, not that TV movie shit. <laughs> yeah, so if you haven't seen it, you, you have no business watching the show. But anyways, uh, so that, that shouldn't be a spoiler alert. Uh, clearly... You know, I, there's, so, there's so much about this show, you know, about this movie. We're not going to we're not going to be able to cover it all. But um, I think Jack, we could start with Jack Nicholson. Uh, he plays he's played other characters where there's a sort of descent into madness. I have to think this one is probably right up there at the top. Um, do you do you think, David, that it was sort of a psychological breakdown? Do you think or do you think the Overlook Hotel sort of had some influence in <laughs> in well, jack's descent <laughs> see I, I happen to know i mean stephen king has talked about like one of the problems he had with the movie uh, if i'm remembering this correctly was that uh, uh kubrick tried to make it more psychological than supernatural and you know in the book it was you know obviously supernatural so yeah but i mean i think you kind of can't have I don't think the supernatural would have worked as well if there wasn't any of the psychological baggage that this guy had. I mean, I think that only helped tip him over the, the edge all the more. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, there's some iconic scenes in the movie uh, when uh, she, uh, Wendy walks in and, and Jack's at the typewriter and he's got his, his great American novel and it's basically a one sentence over and over and over again. Uh, there's whether that's supernatural or psychological, there's something all work extremely no frightening. Makes Jack, no, what was it? <laughs> there you go, that's the one, right? By the way, <laughs> I, I've had that same scene with my own wife where she's come in and I've been doing this thing. I what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that means anything. Maybe my house is haunted. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for a long time, uh, and I think even now, I, I, they downplay it a lot now, but Stephen King wasn't entirely happy with, with the way the, the movie turned right. out. Uh, I don't know, you know, he, I don't know if he felt like he didn't have enough input on the screenplay or whether it just didn't stay, you know, Kubrick didn't stay as true to, to you know, his original vision. But I think from a cinematic standpoint, like if you put the book aside and you judge the story based on just the movie, assuming that's all you've seen, uh, I think it's, it's, it's extremely, it's one of those movies where, there isn't that sort of it's not a slasher film there's not the you know the the big monster uh the fear is all internal and and the whole movie to me felt claustrophobic like they're in this massive in giant house. yeah yeah this massive hotel and yet i felt trapped the whole movie yeah. and i 
I love that. I thought that was so compelling. And that that was all Kubrick with the, the you know the the cinematography. I mean, they they mm-hmm. show the hotel. I mean, they show it from you know the above and all that, and just this vast you know snowy like wilderness around them. It, it just feels very barren and empty, and that that only plays you know into all that claustrophobia. And I, and I I think one of the, the scariest things about it was. I mean, you said Jack Nicholson, you know, descending into madness. What makes this different than, you know, other times he's done it is that he has a wife and child in this hotel trapped with him. And he's like the boogeyman in the closet, basically, like you're just waiting for him to come out. And it's it's horrifying. Um, And it's just, you know, it's scary as all hell. (laughs) Yeah. And and it is because. you know, as far as characters, there's not a lot of characters in the film. Uh, you know, there, there are so, some secondary characters who play some important roles, but really it's about this family. It's about these three people. And the, the person traditionally who's most responsible for protecting the family in that sort of primal and tribal way is the guy that's also the biggest threat. He's the person that's the biggest threat. And I, there's this push pull throughout the whole movie of like, you know, he's the protector, but he's also the threat. And there's, wow, there's just so much there. Uh, what, what do you think? What did you think of? I think her name was Wendy, right? His wife is uh, in there. What did you think of her character? Like, um, she's strong, weak. What, what did you think? Uh, to me, she felt like, you know, an abused wife. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know how much of that was, you know, just of the times. Uh, where women basically almost had a secondary role to their husband, like the man of the house. Like she, she felt like somebody that was, uh, you know, abused mentally by this guy. And um, at the same time, you know, she, she's fighting for her child and stuff. So there, there is an inner strength there, but I think it's, it's almost a reluctant strength to, to, to fight her husband or to think that her husband is, you know, turning into this monster, uh, Cause I, you know, I, I don't think he was, I don't think he started out as an abusive person. I mean, I don't think he's always been this way. I, he's probably been distant and moody, but not, not nothing like this. So, I mean, until now, and until now, I don't think she's ever had a reason to like, just get up and leave his ass. Although right. a lot of women didn't do that back in the day, they wouldn't leave. They'd kind of try and stick it out. Uh, I mean, I might be projecting a little bit here of like what I've seen with other people, uh, you know, in the past, like how they've been stuck in relationships and such. But it, it kind of felt like that to me. Yeah, I agree. There's a uh, there's a there's an element too of this being. I think this came out in 1980 or 1981, uh, and I can't believe I'm saying this like that. It doesn't feel like a long time ago to me, but it, it kind of was. And and like family family dynamics were were very different in the '70s than they are now. That's yeah. been f- almost 40 years, right? So I think there's, you know, there is that 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 piece where women were maybe more subservient or hadn't sort of hadn't felt empowered. They they were not empowered yet, and maybe in certain situations. And I think the the movie kind of played into that. Yeah. Uh, to me, one what. what the Shining is one of my favorite movies. Uh, I don't know if it's top five or not, but it, it's up there. It's top 10, definitely. Mm-hmm. But it is the only movie that I think really, truly terrified me. Uh, and this is when I watched it when I was younger. I, I don't know if I'd have the same feeling now. Uh, I, I haven't watched it recently, um, unfortunately. But I think I think I would be terrified Uh but the, the the thing that scared me most, I think, was uh, when Danny was riding his big wheel up and down the corridor and the ball rolled out. Uh, that is one of the scariest fucking things ever, ever. <laughs> yeah, it's not the elevator. It's not the blood coming out of the elevator. It's no, the- that's <laughs> fine. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> Bloody elevators all the time. But damn, the twin standing there in the hallway uh, and like he takes the big wheel right up to him like that's incredibly frightening i that's just so disturbing yeah um the you know the uh, of course the title uh the title the shining is about this this power um do you think do you think uh, danny had the power the shining right he was able to sort of detect these supernatural entities or these 
uh, this residual energy, whatever happened to be left over. Mm -hmm. Do you think Jack had it all along too, or a touch of it, or did he sort of develop it while they were in the hotel? What did you have any thoughts on on that? I I think he did. I. I, I don't know how much of it was like family because weren't they related uh, to to the descendants? Were they descendants of the people that owned the house? I, th- I think so. Yeah, and it doesn't. He, he looks at the picture, right? And there's the the guy yeah. that looks like him. Uh, yeah, I know the. Uh, I don't know if he was a caretaker. Dick Holleran, uh was just mm. played by Scatman Carruthers, the, the the guy, the old man that saw. Oh, right. Him saw the boy for you know what he was uh right right that's right uh-huh. so he recognized it in him um yeah I, I i'm guessing that it would have been in both the father and the son so yeah yeah there's... i think I, I i i don't know if king or even kubrick played into this at all i i, I imagine king would but i think maybe it has a different has a different hold on you whether you're an innocent or you're not uh mm-hmm. somebody that's you know more they they lived longer their soul is a bit more corrupted might be might have a different uh reaction to these forces within the hotel uh whereas a child would be a little more protected maybe i don't know no i think there's something to that i think i you know i've heard and I've read about some things where, you know, kids are, they're more susceptible to different frequencies, even like, even physiology, like there's physiological difference uh, in, in hearing. Um, yes. I don't know if you've heard this, right? Like teenagers up to teenagers can hear certain frequencies that full grown adults can't hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a, a niece or somebody playing like the sound on the phone, like to see if my old ass could hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't, right? <laughs> barely just like a hiss but not even but just, no <laughs> i don't even know if i heard that or i'm just telling myself that i heard it just so i don't feel so damn old <laughs> <laughs> oh, so if you uh if you were stanley kubrick or you could go back and you could advise stanley kubrick on the ending would you change anything about the ending to the movie um no i mean i, I thought it was a perfect movie it, it I love Stephen King as a writer. Stephen King is a, a TV producer, though. I, I I don't think he always knows what's best when it comes to movies and TV. Mm. I think he should trust the experts. He does what he does, and they do what they do. And because uh, I think some of the best um, the best movies and stuff have been where he hasn't had a whole lot of interaction with it or too much control over the process. Right. Um, that, that could, I mean, some of the movies he's had more of a hand in were just absolutely awful. And I, I know he might not like The Shining. And, and it is interesting that when you think about, you know, it, it's your work. I mean, The Shining is his mm-hmm. book. And, you know, he wants people to see it a certain way. Kubrick has a different vision. Uh, but in some ways, Kubrick's vision, at least on the movie screen, it's a hell of a lot better than the the TV update that they did later on where Stephen King had more of a hand in that. I never even watched that. Was it? I did. And it yeah. was God awful. I mean, you just can't, I, I suppose if you just saw that and you never saw the original, then maybe you'd like it. I don't know, but you can't not compare them. So yeah. Yeah. And plus it was a TV movie, TV movies usually, well, back then they sucked. I think now they're getting a little bit better, but back then the budgetary constraints and all just usually meant bad. Yeah. Yeah. TV in general is much better today than it's ever been. So <laughs> that's God. across the board, right? <laughs> all right. Well, that we was. We had to suffer. We had to suffer. We had to. Watching right? some bad made for TV movies. And oh, don't even get me goodness. started on after school specials. That's, that's true horror. Hey, when I had to look forward to the Dukes of Hazard as my quality television, you know things were bad. <laughs> but we did have the Hulk right after that on CBS on Friday nights. So oh, there you go. That's call. right. That's right. That was on Friday nights. Good yes, call. Yeah. <laughs> they were both old bastards. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Well, we have been talking about uh, The Shining. Uh, uh, David, I'd like to thank you for dropping by and talking horror movies with me. It's been really cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I've got a great interview for you on this segment. 
This is the current president of the Horror Writers Association, Lisa Morton. Now, Lisa recently became the president due to the unfortunate passing of Rocky Wood. Uh, however, before that, uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa has had a tremendous career in, uh, in the world of horror. Uh, she's written screenplays. She's had movies made. She's a, she's a writer. Uh, she's a fascinating speaker. Uh, and she also happens to be one of the world's foremost experts on the holiday of Halloween. Uh, and I tried stumping her in this interview, but, uh, but, but I couldn't do it. So she knows her stuff. Uh, we did have uh, a Google Hangout, didn't quite cooperate with us, so there are a little bit of technical glitches in there. Uh, if you're listening on the audio side, you won't notice anything, but visually it's not the best, but it wasn't going to stop us and it didn't detract from the interview. So I uh, hope you really enjoy it. There's also a special uh, cameo in there, a little Easter egg for you. We'll see if you can figure out who shows up in our interview. Uh, and if you're, and we'll see if you're paying attention. So again, this is the president of the Horror Writers Association, Lisa Morton. Enjoy. All right. So I'm very fortunate uh, today to have with me uh, Lisa, Lisa Morton, who, amongst other things, is the uh, president of the Horror Writers Association. But uh, I'm not going to blab on about her. I'm going to uh, let Lisa tell you a little bit about who she is and what she does. So welcome, Lisa. Hey, thanks for having me, James. Um, yeah, I am the president of the Horror Writers Association, but before that, and hopefully maybe even above that, I'm a writer first and foremost. Um, I've also managed to become one of the world's leading experts on Halloween. I'm not even sure how that happened, but it did. And uh, I like to call myself a reformed screenwriter. Um, in the past, I did a bunch of those really horrible movies that you find on the sci-fi channel at three in the morning. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> well, I can't stand to watch them, but yeah, I, otherwise it's, it's good. Are you, are you comfortable throwing a few of those titles out there? Sure. Uh, Blood Angels, um, Blue Demon, The Glass Trap. Um, Blue Demon, I think, has the distinction of being the only shark movie in which no one actually dies from a shark attack. But hey, that was not my draft. So, <laughs> so nothing to do with Sharknado then. Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, you, that's a that's an interesting career path, uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who know what screenwriters do, or have at least heard what, it, what a screenwriter is. How how do you become a screenwriter, and how did you become a reformed screenwriter? Um, you know, it actually is what I majored in in college. Believe it or not, I I did major in film at UC. CLA. Um, I always wanted to be a screenwriter from the time I was a kid and saw The Exorcist. And uh, I worked my way through the ranks of the film industry for about 10 years before I sold my first screenplay, and that was a movie called Meet the Hollowheads. I actually like that one, by the way. <laughs> um, and then after that, I did a few more of them, but it was never incredibly satisfying to me. And after a while, when you have a bunch of these movies that are out that you're frankly kind of embarrassed to see your name on. Um, you look for something else. And it was the mid nineties when I finally said, I think I kind of want to do my own thing in fiction. So I turned to prose more at that point. I still do screenwriting from time to time, but I'm happy to do um, like ghost writing jobs now where my name's not even on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. I, you know, I've I've never written a screenplay, but it, is it true that the, the screenplay goes through dozens and dozens of hands before it's what you see when you go to the movie theater? Well, you know, on these small budget things, which is the kind of stuff I've been involved with, um, they don't have enough money to pay dozens and dozens of hands. So yeah. usually there's me, maybe one other person, and usually it's the director, the director or the producer who just comes in and just takes whatever you've done and shreds it. Technical difficulties. Please stand by. Okay. Um, yeah, in a in a small budget movie where there isn't a lot of money to throw around. I mean, we're talking movies that have budgets of two million or less. Um, they don't have enough money to be able to afford a lot of screenwriters. Uh, so usually it's just. You, the person who wrote the first draft, maybe one other person, and then a director or producer gets their hands on it, and that's when it goes right to hell. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think I had mentioned on one movie of mine, The Glass Trap, um, by the time that was done, 
the only resemblance it bore to my draft was the title, one, one character name, and the very basic concept and setting, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> and but you know there's your name splashed all over this thing and you look at it and unfortunately the changes were not improvements so oh, okay. they were really really dumb and now your name's all over this thing you know and and it's not something you're proud of so that was one of the big reasons I got more into prose fiction stuff perfect segue because I was about to ask how you yeah. make that transition and was your screenwriting experience Part of the reason for that transition. Yes, it certainly was. And it turned out to oddly enough be helpful. Um, by the time I was looking to get more into prose writing, um, there were a couple of movies that actually were good. Meet the Hollowheads had a little fan base. And in the mid 90s, when I started going I started going to some of the conventions like the world fantasy conventions and so forth and a lot of the editors there actually were fans of like meet the hollow heads so it gave me a good talking point with them and you know we would go to a party and by the time uh, an hour had passed they'd be saying I'll be happy to read anything you send me um, and in fact I was very lucky I sold the second story I ever submitted which I I, I feel really bad sometimes when I say that because, you know, most writers go through a lot of rejection before they can sell a piece of prose. But on the other hand, I'd been writing screenplays for 10 years, so I was not a complete newbie. Yeah, that, that's, that is impressive. The second piece. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> impressive and very lucky. There's so much luck in all of this stuff. You know, you just happen to have the right piece that the editor is looking for at the right time. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There is an element of luck to everything and you can't plan for it and you and you can't manufacture it. You just have to hope it shows up when you need it. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you transition in the, in the mid to late 90s, you transition into writing uh, fiction and now you are the president of the Horror Writers Association. So uh, what's, what's, how, how do you get from, from A to B? Well, that's only been the case since December when unfortunately our last president passed away, Rocky Wood. Um, I've been involved with HWA since the late 90s in some form or other um, because I'm in LA and a lot of our um, presidents in the past were in LA or were in the West Coast. And I, they would invariably be coming to me saying, can you help out with something? Oh, guest appearance by Pinky. <laughs> Um, I kind of guess in this in this interview. This is great. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I started doing a lot of things for the association. I started as treasurer, and I would help out with other organizing events and so forth. And um, a few years ago, I made it into being the vice president. And then, of course, when Rocky passed away, um, I uh, in December of last year I became the president and fortunately it is something that I was prepared for having done all the other jobs but um, it's a humongous job so it's still um, it unfortunately the timing was very bad it coincided with me moving and trying to finish a deadline on a huge nonfiction book and so I'm just now kind of starting to really get rolling in the job. Yeah, not not under the best circumstances, but congratulations, no. anyways. Uh, I'm, Thanks. I'm an active member of the association, and I think we all sort of knew, you know, what was what was sort of happening. And like I said, not the best circumstances, but uh, congratulations, anyways. Uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I know that writers uh, are very familiar with trade organizations, and every a lot of genre fiction uh, genre fiction people have their have their own associations. What is, um, what's that mean for a reader? Why would, what's the Horror Writers Association and why should a fan of horror even, even know about it or care about it? Um, we offer a lot of things to all kinds of people at different, ay, 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 different <laughs> aspects. She wants to be a member very badly, obviously. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, we have a fantastic monthly newsletter with all kinds of interviews and articles and so forth. We have our big events every year. Um, we have all kinds of things from, you know, a lot of the people who join start as fans, just readers, but end up thinking maybe I want to try writing at which point we offer mentor programs. Um, and we have a lot of interesting things coming up for the future too. We are, uh, actually looking at some co-op things with like SFWA, the science fiction organization 
And so there's a lot of nice things that the organization does for, for fans, for readers, for um, filmmakers. That's something we're exploring more. We're exploring more about how to work with graphic novelists, which is exciting. Um, and of course, it also gives a, a fan or a reader the chance to be part of the process that votes the Bram Stoker Awards every year because anybody can recommend a work for the Stoker Awards. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would also add, too, that you you can be a supporting member of the association. So if you are a fan right. of horror and you want to you want to support it, you can do that. And and you have some great web uh, resources. So on the website and, and I'll link to this for everyone who's, who's maybe listening in the car right now on, horror, um, you know, the, the Horror Writers uh, uh, Association homepage, there's a, a, a splash banner of new releases. So you can you can kind of keep up to date on on uh, new books that are coming out. A lot, lot of great stuff for, for fans as well. Yeah, absolutely. Our blog is fantastic. And um, in fact, um, even beyond readers, we are trying to reach out more to librarians and to booksellers to to let them know about all the great new horror books that are out there. Yes, yes, and and I would, uh, I would, I've uh, on previous podcasts have, have mentioned that one of the one of the things that I really like about this particular association is it's forward focused, and 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 the Horror Writers Association, while while sort of having their roots in a tradition, is also changing and adapting with the times. So allowing self publishers and independent publishers into the association and utilizing techno newer technology. I think of the. Uh, the selfie, the selfie promotion uh, in the fall. I wonder maybe you could, since you're that, the Halloween uh, person, if you could uh, talk about that for a minute. That was really neat. That was great. That was, I can't take credit for that. That was Rocky's <laughs> baby. And uh, it was brilliant. And it was really fun. And it is something we're going to keep doing. Um, we're going to try and do some different variants on it um, coming up over the years. So it's not totally dead yet. But yeah, we, I, I've always been very dedicated to the idea that we need to keep moving forward and investigating the new technologies. Um, I was all in favor of the letting, uh, involving the indie um authors more with uh, the organization and um so yeah it's we're always looking at new things like that i think we may have been one of the first writers organizations for example to um self-publish an ebook form one of our existing previous anthologies that came out last year that was f paul wilson's freak show and so i was really that was something i did kind of spearhead and i was happy with that and proud that that's out there now and continues our legacy from the past into the future yes and and what do, what do you see that future being for for the genre of horror uh is are you optimistic about it are you are there's things that are troubling to you? Uh, I'm curious to sort of, you know, as you look out to the horizon, what's in store for horror fans? I'm very optimistic about it right now. I, I'm kind of one of those people who thinks we're sort of in a golden age of horror at the moment. Um, there, It seems to be advancing in sort of uh, craftsmanship and the, the markets are still slim, but are improving every day. I think um, we're seeing uh, I think we're going to move past that sort of scary period that we had for a while where, for example, Barnes and Noble didn't even have a horror section. Um, it seems like a lot of that stuff is coming back. There's a big growth of indie bookstores right now, which is really exciting. Um, so, you know, hopefully we we'll, we can work with those indie bookstores, get more horror titles onto their shelves. Uh, I think the genre is really healthy right now. Yeah. Interesting. And And what role do you think the technology is going to play uh, moving forward, uh, not just Amazon, but sort of uh, electronic media in general and sort of hybrid media, you know, maybe uh, mixing film and, and prose. And do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I, and we're trying to adapt to all of that. I mean, we would love to involve, for example, gaming is going to be is getting bigger and bigger all the time with the horror survival games and so forth. Um, that's something we want to explore more about. Uh, the, you know, the, obviously the explosive growth of young adult and graphic novels are things we want to get more involved with. Um, yeah, it's it's going to keep changing and growing. That the hybrid, the e-publishing, and combined with um, traditional print is very exciting and it's very interesting, especially to a lot of authors, because it gives us a chance to find new ways to make, you know, increase our revenue streams. Obviously, and we want to be able to make sure that all of HWA's writer members will know about that and be able to take advantage of that. Excellent. That's great. 
Uh, I would, it would be hard for me to, to not, uh, not at least ask you uh, about some Halloween stuff while I, <laughs> while I'm interviewing you. So I, I yay, <laughs> yeah, you mentioned a little bit that you're, uh, you know, you're one of the leading experts on on Halloween, and and you've published a lot of stuff on it. So I thought I I was gonna try and stump you with a question. Do you, are you, do you think you're up for that? Sure. Okay. So here's my here's my question. Let's see if you can get this now. What Christian holiday? is somewhat based on Halloween and happens the day after. Well, All Souls Day. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself. I was like, oh, I <laughs> Actually, it's, it's technically, it's slightly the other way around. All Souls Day has been incorporated somewhat into Halloween. Um, oh, see, I was going to goof on you and you turned it right back around yeah. on me. That was brilliant. <laughs> I'll even give you the whole history of All Souls Day if you want it, but it oh. has actually it has a really interesting um, origin. I don't know if you've ever heard this sort of apocryphal story about where All Souls Day might have come from, but there I'd was love to it, hear it. <laughs> it was started by a guy named Saint Odolo in the 11th century, and at that point the Christian Church was celebrating All Saints Day on November 1st, and people were getting kind of um, twitchy about that because all it all that I recognized was dead saints. And a lot of people were saying, well, what about my loved ones? So they were kind of thinking about doing this anyway. So the legend is that St. Odolo was in, I think it was Italy, something like that, near the base of Mount Etna. And he heard these screams coming out of this tunnel in the, in the volcano. And they were supposed to be the screams of the damned being tortured in hell or something. And he decided he wanted to try and help those people escape purgatory in hell. So he created All Souls Day for people to, to pray for their loved ones and to remember their loved ones. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. What, it's a pretty is, strange story. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. What's in in your research and in uh, everything you know about Halloween? What's one of the one of the major misconceptions sort of the general public or the mainstream has about the holiday? Any aspect of it? I there are a couple of big ones. Um, the the notion that well, of course, S A M H A I N being the pronounced Samhain, which people perpetually mispronounce as Samhain, but was the Celtic holiday that the uh, Catholic Church probably co-opted to create Halloween and All Saints Day. And there are a lot of, I see these things all the time that will say something like um, costuming goes back to the ancient Druids did this on Samhain and all. No, they didn't. I'm sorry. Um, there's, we know very little about Samhain truthfully, but what we know is that it was mainly a three day feast and um, they didn't tell ghost stories and because we have mythological tales about that and so forth. One of the other things that I see all the time that makes me crazy is that trick or treat is hundreds of years old. No, trick or treat is like uh, 70 years old. And it's, I, I mean, I can even ask my dad, did you go trick or treating? And he'll say yes. And I say, really? And he says, oh, no. <laughs> so it really is not that old. Um, yes, there have been various forms of like masked begging and so forth associated with Halloween for centuries, but the actual kids put on costumes, go door to door, say trick or treat, get candy, 70 years old. Wow. And uh, can you pinpoint? the origin of that or did that sort of evolve over a number of years it kind of evolved I, there it, i'm it's very close to being able to pinpoint it and weirdly enough it may have started in canada um, we think of it being so american but the first recorded use of the phrase trick or treat at halloween is something like 1927 in i think alberta um, and then you start to get a few little instances of the whole ritual happening um in like Oregon and the West Coast of the United States in the 30s. It's not really in place until kind of the late 30s. And then after World War II is when it really spreads throughout the whole country. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, I could uh, I could be totally selfish and, and listen to you tell me Halloween stories all afternoon, but uh, I'm, I'm going to resist that temptation <laughs> and, uh, and just kind of wrap up here. I, uh, I want to really thank you again for uh, chatting with me. It was, it was a lot of fun and it was, it was interesting. And uh, I really appreciate the time. And I know you're going to do great things for the HWA. Oh, thanks so much, James. We're going to try. I know. Great. Great. Thanks again. So, uh, okay. Hold on here for a second. And we'll be right back. <laughs> 